Hello and welcome on the Watches TV. Welcome on the first edition of Prime Time and a very happy new year to all. All our very best wishes and to start 2020 on a new note where we've slightly updated our channel identity and we are extremely inspired and motivated to pursue our coverage of watchmaking uh, with the goal of publishing at least two new video reports per week and to do so well the team has slightly gotten bigger here at our Watches Club Old Town Geneva office and I therefore want to thank again so much our patrons who help us uh, make it possible and obviously anyone one is very welcome to join the party on Patreon, especially that we shall uh, shortly implement a very special bonus feature for those uh, supporting us, and I will come back on this in due time. But to make all these contents possible, well, the team still has to grow a little bit, and concretely, we are looking for someone with uh, journalistic skills, someone uh, quite passionate about watchmaking, but you don't have to be a total watch nerd. This will come over time automatically. And uh, well, someone with indispensable good writing skills, but ultimately willing to go on camera too. So someone that will fit the spirit of the team and could help us keep the momentum accelerating. Well, and for those interested, well, you will find a form on our website, link below. And though we've started to look for someone here in Geneva, well, you don't have to be based in uh, Switzerland, uh, but in Europe for sure, as you will naturally have to come to Geneva uh, once in a while. So I thought that it was the right thing to do and uh, reach out directly to you guys, because, I mean, who knows? Maybe there could be someone out there just perfect for this uh, watchmaking mission. Anyhow, I also wanted to uh, simply thank all of you since you are now more than 112,000 subscribed to this channel. It makes us uh, very proud. Uh, thanks for the engagements, uh, thanks for the comments, the shares, the likes and so forth. It's a real motivation for us and additional to this, well, we've traveled quite a lot in 2019 and you can't imagine how nice it has been to meet people all around the world who have very nicely come up to me and thanking our little team with what we do. It makes us feel purposeful and this is sincerely a very rewarding feeling. So hope to meet even more people this year would be a great sign. Okay, quick uh, wrist check. Uh, that's my Beauvais Chrono from 1949. Such, uh, in such impeccable condition. I mean, I just love it. Really, really do. Okay, wrist check done. And this is prime time. Watchmaking in the news. And it will be uh, quite a long one with not only the latest newsworthy stories regarding the, the watchmaking industry, but uh, we will also come back on some of the main highlights, uh, the most uh, significant uh, new watches, the tops and flops, the main trends and business news of 2019. Uh, will, it will be a fun little recap moment and uh, what can we learn from it. So let's start with some pretty fresh news and a pretty incomprehensible story in this uh, rather complicated context for watchmaking. And we don't yet have the definite official numbers, but based on what we already know, well, the overall turnover of the Swiss uh, watchmaking industry has apparently seen a small increase of export figures. Uh, it's uh, very marginal, but makes people feel good, kind of a placebo effect. But the overall production volumes have declined quite drastically. I mean, we're talking approximately 3.5 million uh, fewer watches produced in a single year. So that's, approx that's approximately 15% less. And this is hurting in particular the lower tier segment of watches uh, produced here. The luxury segment is still doing strong and increasing in fact. But this, is, this has a really meaningful impact uh, on the entire industry. And we'll come back on this in another video. Well, anyhow, a few days before Christmas, the Swiss Competition Commission, kind of an antitrust commission, well, they just uh, sent out a really sweet present to the Swatch Group and suddenly and rather brutally told them that they could no longer deliver, they deliver ETA movements uh, to third-party brands, uh, meaning the likes of Breitling, IWC, Chopin, Tag Heuer, Boy and Mercier, and so many other brands. And this as of the 1st of January. So we're talking roughly 500,000 movements for which these brands have to find an alternative. Alternative. So ultimately this commission came slightly back on this decision but just pushing it back uh, for a few months. So in the short term there are, like I said, no real alternative to the sourcing of such movements uh, by other suppliers. And the big irony of this story goes back to some 10 years ago when uh, the Swatch Group announced at the time that they would stop delivering movements, a Bosch and uh, other kind of components to third-party brands 
And at the time, it was the same commission uh, which obliged the group to continue it delivering these brands. So one doesn't really understand everything, I mean, the politics uh, behind, uh, but it can still be summarized that uh, kind of what goes around comes around for the Swatch Group. Uh, but this, again, will naturally uh, make the life of uh, some of these uh, brands quite complicated. Uh, we will follow up on this, uh, but in this rather shaky business environment, uh, the timing of this decision may really sound, I mean, quite odd, I have to be honest. Okay, next news, and more brands from the Richmond Group are now offering eight years of guarantees on their watches, Paranarai, uh, IWC. And this is obviously a really good thing. I mean, it should simply be a standard, and I just don't understand the ones which are still offering only two years. I mean, if you trust your products uh, that you're selling, well, give the customer a clear sign that that's the case. You know, as simple as that. Okay, next, and let's uh, talk about the crown. 2019 was quite a crazy year for Rolex. I mean, benefiting from such hype, just amazing. And to cope with the situation, what well, we heard about production capabilities increases, uh, but that's all very secret and difficult to verify. But on the other hand, one thing very public and announced uh, just recently is that as of the 1st of January, Rolex has increased the prices of its model by approximately 8%. And you know what? Well, I doubt it will have uh, much effect on the desirability of most of its uh, products and will just increase the smile on the retailer's faces and for those who bought the models in 2019. Well, for you, I mean, you just saved 8%. I mean, obviously this price increase will also be good for Rolex's uh, balance sheet, but uh, did they really need it? Well, okay. Talking about uh, Rolex and desirability, one has to quickly talk about the flipping of some of these uh, hyped watches. And one has to say that we've seen prices go a bit down in the last uh, couple of months. And say, uh, and same can be said uh, regarding Patek plus a few AP and uh, Richard Mille models. Okay, and still concerning Rolex, and this will uh, most probably create some kind of precedent, as they recently started to sue a company customizing some of their models and claiming that they are actually counterfeiters. So interestingly enough, Rolex went, uh, went against an American uh, LA-based company called La Californienne. And I say this because there are obviously so many similar companies around the world, even a few here in Switzerland. So I guess times uh, might become a bit complicated uh, for those doing these uh, customization. Uh, and it mustn't be a comfortable feeling to have a horde of uh, Rolex lawyers on your back, uh, but I'm really interested in seeing uh, the outcome of this lawsuit. It will be a pretty explicit demonstration of the power of the crown. Anyhow, I mean, there is such a fine line in terms of what can and can't be done, but I personally think that the biggest issue is that most of these uh, people slash companies are really playing in a gray zone, basically insinuating that you are purchasing a true Rolex, and this is uh, where the problem lies. And will remain in California as the state recently banned as of the 1st of January. The use of crocodile for watch straps actually goes a little bit beyond this. Uh, but this is a trend uh, which I believe we will see more and more uh, in the coming years. And we've already seen, uh, for instance, alternatives like uh, calfskin and even bracelets from uh, vegetal origin uh, embossed uh, with crocodile and alligator patterns. Okay, and still regarding the US, and since I had talked about this a few months ago, well, I was really pretty excited to head to Miami for the February edition of Watches and Wonder. A bit of sun, some nice cocktails, some nice watches, and nice people, well, you know, kind of sounded perfect. But this event has just disappeared from the agenda, and the bizarre thing about it is that there was no real communication regarding uh, the cancellation of the event. This was very quietly done and just proved once again the challenge of organizing watch shows. And on that matter, well, naturally 2020 will be a pretty decisive year for the future of the two main venues of uh, Baselworld and SIH. This last one now rebranded uh, Watches and Wonder. I know it can be a little bit confusing. Well, anyhow, both shows will now be running one after the other, like in the good old days. Actually, I mean, the good old days was uh, when there was only one show. Well, anyhow, SIH being first here in Geneva, end of April, followed by Basel uh, event, early May. And when I say decisive, well, uh, you have to remember that some big names continue to pull out. I mean, we knew about uh, Richard Mille, out of the SIH, uh, but they've done so in, uh, in style, let's say, with this rather eccentric bonbon collection, or Audemars Piguet, but obviously this was a bit uh, less flamboyant with the questionable introduction of the Code 1159. And we've just heard that Grubel Force is also leaving uh, the Geneva show. 
But uh, the hemorrhage uh, also concerned Basel world as Seiko and Breitling are also out. So yes, this may sound all quite gloomy and anyhow for me, well, I mean, the benchmark of a success successful event was definitely set last year by the Dubai Watch Week. I mean, that, what, an, what an amazing event that was. I mean, still have fantastic souvenirs of it. Okay, let's uh, now have a bit of fun and let's come back on some of the most memorable moments of uh, 2019 uh, in some kind of compilation of reports published during the year. And we'll start with uh, what I think were the more noticeable, innovative timepieces of the year. And actually, Vachon Constantin definitely introduced a super interesting and pertinent timepiece with the traditional twin beat. This is a timepiece uh, which has uh, two um, balance springs, so two frequencies. So we have, uh, we, the user can choose between two modes. One mode that we have, uh, that we have uh, named the active mode, on which the watch is functioning to uh, 5 Hertz, so 36,000 vibrations per hour, offering four days of power reserve, and you just select the mode standby. And by doing so, we are changing the, the oscillator, and we have a 1.2 Hertz oscillator, which is giving us more than 65 days of power reserve without losing the indication of the perpetual calendar. Sincerely, I was very happy that such a traditional brand as Vacheron could show us what uh, they are capable in terms of innovation. And on a very different level, and this time talking about a pretty recent brand, I liked what uh, Ressens came up with, but obviously this is very, very different. And for diehard mechanical purists, well, some might not appreciate it as much. So in a concrete way, it means that your mechanical watch will set itself automatically to the time you decided it has to be in and you will never have to wind it anymore because the watch will stop if you don't wear it and, and as it is a mechanical watch with an automatic movement when you wear it you wind it and if, if you take it off for more than 12 hours e-crown because that's the name of the technology will stop the, the, the mechanical movement and from the moment you put it back on the wrist, you double tap the glass, it will set the watch to the right time and it will start to run again. Okay, another big uh, technical introduction this year came from Tag Heuer, but this didn't go too well. Hello and we are by Tag Heuer, who are using for the very first time some super high-tech material for its hairspring, something that has been applied for an industrial produced uh, collection. Let's check it out. Maybe the most exciting part of the watch, uh, which you can see from the outside, is what we call our isograph technology. This is a new hairspring technology developed in-house and it's the biggest single change to traditional um, regulating organs since the 1600s. And we make it in-house out of carbon. It's a carbon a composite of carbon nanotubes and amorphous carbon. So we have the rigidity of the nanotubes blended with the plastic properties of the amorphous carbon. And we design the hairspring in-house using in-house um, computer software to develop the perfect hairspring to mate with our balance wheel, which in this case is made out of aluminum. Yes, this was the main highlight of tying her at this year's Basel World. I mean, sounded very promising. But after the first batches of watches were shipped uh, on the different market, well, they had massive issues with it and simply had to pull it out. I mean, totally stopped talking about it. Uh, and to this day, I mean, the Otavia uh, remain now a classical hairspring powered watch. So very strangely, this didn't really catch uh, the attention of anybody and might just prove uh, once again that people forget things very easily. I mean, we didn't. And also proved that uh, to bring serious innovation, well, it's uh, definitely a hard path to walk. Remember when the same team uh, introduced the Zenith DeFi Lab? Well, it took them a while between uh, the announcement, the spectacular announcement, and the final delivery of the first few pieces. Regarding other major technical achievements of the year, I really love the Hermès L'Heure de la Lune, such a cool and playful watch hiding a true complex mechanism. First of all, we have to put all the indications through the center. It comes from the base movement and goes through the center and then uh, redirected to the sub-dial. We have two uh, moon phases, make one turn in 59 uh, days. And uh, parallel to that, we have also the 31 uh, gearing or T's for the date. And uh, for the correction, we have to place both uh, star wheels in the same position at one place to make the correction. 
In terms of playfulness, well, Haute-Lance also had something fun to show. The HR Sphere is really reusing this essence of this product and the DNA of Haute-Lance, I think, is really present with a three-dimensional uh, sphere that show the time with a 450 degrees turn every hour and with a retrograde minute. 2019 offered us quite a fireworks of a multi-axis tourbillon behind which we find the same genius watchmaker Mr. Eric Coudray and once personified in the spectacular MBNF legacy machine Thunderdome. So Kari designed the back of the movement and you're going to see this incredibly beautiful pocket watch looking like movement highest level of finishing, hand finishing on everything. Uh, you turn that piece around and you'll see the world of Eric Coudray come to life. I asked Eric one thing. I want the craziest, most insane 3D kinetic sculpture regulator you've done. He went all in. He went all in. So you've got the largest, fastest multiple axis tourbillon or regulator in the world. Um, between size and speed. To give you an idea, the three cages turn in one in 20 seconds, one in 12 seconds, one in eight seconds. That is insanely quick. And another variant with the Pernal Double Spherion. Alors, le but c'était de faire un organe avec différentes cages pour neutraliser le, le, les effets de la pesanteur sur le balancier pour avoir un, un réglage meilleur. Donc euh, c'est parti en mettant, <coughs> en mettant trois cages les unes dans les autres. Et puis les spécificités pour avoir des, des vitesses rapides des cages. On a utilisé un échappement qui est, qui est assez ancien, mais qui permet de faire ça, qui est un échappement poté. But coming back uh, on MBNF, well, their first ladies watch was also greeted uh, with big success with the flying tea. I have no idea what a woman wants. So I realized this can only work if I stop thinking what would they like and I instead put in a mechanical sculpture everything I love in the women of my life. And so you've got this dome, and under the dome you've got the life. And that was linked to maternity for me. And if you, if you turn the piece around, the rotor is this incredible sun, because it's the same thing, I gravitate around them. Bulgari continued to impress uh, when it comes to extra thin watches, beating a record every year and sadly making us completely forget that this used to be Piaget's territory. So uh, you can set the time with the, with the push button at nine, uh, nine o'clock and you have on the, other, on the other side you have the push button to start and stop and reset the chronograph. It's a peripheric rotor movement, uh, the movement is a bit wider because we have the, the platinum peripheric rotor. It's not only a chronograph, it's a GMT chronograph, so it's uh, two of the most useful complications that everybody wants to use. And what to say about Gribel Force, who double pushed the limits of their GMT with the crazy quadruple tourbillon version. We're, we're looking at is, uh, of course, our iconic uh, GMT display here with the rotating globe turning in real time, giving us the first uh, visual time around the world. Then, of course, we've got uh, a red GMT hand here which is uh, operated by the, uh, the pusher at four o'clock. And then we've got the, a third time zone, in fact, with your local time, which you can synchronize anywhere around the world. And the tourbillon one and two, tourbillon three and four, iconic side view, the sapphire ring giving the equator position here, a view down to the southern hemisphere during the daytime, and then the uh, movement side. So here we see the uh, characteristic 24 cities, 24 time zone disc, rotating in real time again. And yes, I said double because uh, then they introduced something we wouldn't have uh, necessarily expected from them, a sports version of the GMT. So the first aspect which uh, stands out is obviously the curved shape of the case. Uh, it is properly uh, rounded uh, and sits just marvelously on the wrist. So one of the cool aspects of all this is that when you look at it uh, from the top, the case, uh, the watch really seems round in fact, uh, but in reality it's much more overweight, kind of a little optical illusion which works just fine. But good news didn't stop there as we had the great privilege of following undercover the making of their very first fully handmade timepiece. The difference is really what uh, we sometimes like to call the intelligence of the hand. The gestures have to be an extension of the hand. So it means that, uh, you know, we are here in the workshop, what we call our Atelier Tradition at Global 4C, 
and uh, this means that here there is no uh, numerical control, no computer-driven uh, equipment. Uh, to really master making the different techniques of components, different types, uh, it could easily take 10 or 15 years of practice to get really to the top level, as, uh, as we say, in terms of precision, uh, to be able to make a reliable and uh, precise uh, handmade timepiece. And since we're full of good news, well, uh, we shall hopefully pretty soon publish the, this kind of documentary approach film that we did about it. I think you will really like it. Coming soon. Okay, but uh, watchmaking doesn't stop to Switzerland. And we got to see some pretty interesting people and timepieces uh, elsewhere, such as this uh, really original automatic uh, Hamatic by German brand Moritz Grossmann. No rotor, no peripheral rotor, no micro rotor, but instead a hammer like component, thus its names, hammer, hamatic. And this very different looking component works by flipping from one side to the other around the top axis and by moving ever so slightly, even by five degrees, this will fuel up the energy stored in the barrel. So, though we are talking traditional mechanical watchmaking, it seriously looks different. The architecture of the movement looks different as a whole. We are really not used to this and it required more than three years of development uh, by the team of Moritz Grossman to finalize uh, this movement. In London we also got to see an amazing timepiece uh, from Charles uh, Frotsham with a very complex regulating organ and just love the story behind this watch's uh, development. We wanted to show the iconography of the company, we wanted to show the roots of the company and yet we wanted it to be a 21st century company. So we looked at material sciences, uh, we looked at escapement technology, we have succeeded. Uh, we've made a development of George Daniel's double impulse chronometer, fitting it to a wristwatch which had never previously been done. We were also very happy to go to Japan and meet the very interesting independent watchmaker Hajime Azaoka. <laughs> それで実際にまあ、え、オリジナルの時計を制作して発売し出したのは2011年からですが、ですからまあ2011年が私の独立時計としてのキャリアのスタートということになると思います。で、以来、え、8年余り、え、活動してきております。例えば、えっと、一番
honor is safe, more or less. And in the last edition of Primetime, I had a good time and laugh uh, talking about the new Bell & Ross BR05 collection with this mix of so many existing icons. Well, the idea behind this, of course, is that uh, in the market, there is a pent-up demand for luxury steel watches. And as we all know in the industry, there are some of them you just can't get. It's all circular, so when you look at the designs, there are no straight lines anywhere. And we've developed the fir our first uh, in-house automatic movement. It's a very robust movement, so this is not a slim eight millimeter thing. This is a robust watch. And we couldn't do a summary of the year without mentioning. Yes, this was quite something and in my eyes has contributed at making watchmaking enter kind of a new world, a new dimension. Uh, but I was also happy uh, that we witnessed the acknowledgement of George Daniels' uh, contribution to watchmaking uh, with the highest price reach uh, by an independent, okay, in a certain way, Patek is also independent, but anyhow. And this piece is his first and only watch to feature not only a perpetual calendar, but it's an instantaneous perpetual calendar, meaning all the functions jump precisely at uh, midnight. It has a um, minute repeater designed by himself. It has a thermometer. It has a um, tourbillon with coaxial escapement, of course, equation of time, power reserve, and an annual calendar which indicates the the number of, uh, of days in that, in that specific um, uh, month. And in 2019, I was also very happy to have had as much birthday celebration as I did with our new unboxing series. And we shall continue with this. I mean, they are definitely fun to do, but we'll really concentrate on some pretty crazy timepieces. You know, might as well make uh, these birthday as uh, worthwhile as possible. But we will also continue to produce uh, these uh, walkthrough videos because we really love making them. And for me, the surprise of the year was the incredible success in terms of audience of our Jacob & Co video reports. And we don't really know why or maybe could it be? Yeah, and they're not bad at other stuff too, if you see what I mean. The main novelties in Basel this year is uh, we have first time ever showing, introducing Casino Astronomia, where you actually could uh, bet on the numbers and it always gives you a new number. Yes, I was and still I'm quite surprised by the massive views uh, these vids uh, got and doing a walk through Jacob & Co could therefore interest a few people, uh, it seems. But on a less glamorous but extremely meaningful level, you guys know we love the suppliers of this industry, the ones making it all possible. And for this, well, we always love to go to the EPHG. I mean, that's a trade fair dedicated to them. But this year, I hope we'll be able to visit more of them directly in their environment and disclose uh, together some of their secrets. The, the EPHG, as, um, as a service that it provides, is for me one of the most interesting exhibitions that I actually visit and the, the reason for that is that ideas are, are very easy 
Um, but the most complicated part in actually realizing a, the final product is the process. And to get to the end of that process, you need to know the companies who are based here. So in 2019, obviously, uh, one uh, great moment for us was when we celebrated our 100k subscriber and had this little uh, nice uh, uh, party here in Geneva with some great people. Not to mention Mr. Philippe Dufour, obviously. It was great to meet all you guys and I hope we'll have another good excuse to do another party here in our Watchers Club. Okay, well, I mean, this is finally it for this first edition of Primetime, a special edition, of course. Thanks for watching, thanks to our patrons, and without insisting too much, but I mean, you're all welcome to join in, as I mentioned. And if you're interested in collaborating with us uh, and be part of the journalistic team, well, don't hesitate to inquire and uh, more info on our website. And finally, well, we have uh, some good stuff coming your way, such as a walkthrough of Acrivia. I mean, that's our neighbors uh, just uh, out there. Just a little bit of teasing. So let's go for our first and enthusiastic Viva Watchmaking of 2020. Happy New Year and see you real soon.